let's start with uh, some economic data points that we had last week. We had durable goods. Uh, we had uh, PMIs, S&P PMIs, uh, and an update to GDP now. This is the uh, durable goods uh, report put out by the Census Bureau. This is important. Uh, the name of it, M3-1, uh, is the more technical name of it. Uh, negative 5.2%. The reason I point that out is because we're going to see that a little later on. Negative 5.2%. Uh, June revised to plus four point four percent. So we can. Uh, this is a uh, a noisy data series to begin with. It's a volatile data series. Uh, so uh, when you see this kind of activity going on in the chart, that's 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 sort of normal for this data series. But this is a big move, negative five point two. The tables help attribute it. Uh, two things will stand out in this report is uh, the low count on the number of tables. You have one for new orders, and if you scroll down, you have one for total inventories. That's it, just two tables. The other thing that you will notice is the Census Bureau's fascination with trying to get the smallest font on the page that they possibly can. I have this expanded at 200%, and you can still see how small the font is. So, break it up. Have one table for seasonally adjusted, have another for not seasonally adjusted so that you can read it. If you print this out, you can't read it. You can't read it without a microscope. And you're probably going to need an electron microscope uh, to be able to read the font because it is really, really small. Here's your 5.2. Uh, right up here, your headline number. This is for new orders. This is the total. If you take out transportation, uh, it was actually up 0.5 if you get rid of transportation. So we know it was something in the transportation sector. So we can sort of just scroll down. You have a whole bunch of categories. Primary metals up 0.1. Uh, fabricated metal products, new orders up 0.7. Uh, machinery, new orders up 1.1. Uh, computers, computer and related products, communication equipment. We can see that this is down 0.1, but it's mostly uh, computers and related products down 2.2 and communication equipment up 1.2. Let's get to transportation. Here it is, new orders, negative 14.3. Uh, but the consumer facing, uh, which is motor vehicles and parts, 0 0.8, up 0 0.8. Here's the big drop, aircraft. This is non-defense aircraft and parts, negative 43.6. Now remember, this is seasonally adjusted. So it's not as if, oh, well, maybe there was just no orders uh, in this particular month. If there were no orders typically in August, then this would, this would be zero. Uh, it would show nothing. Uh, so that means, based on the seasonality, this is a drop of 43.6%, and for defense, negative 10.9. Coming into capital goods, headline was negative 13.7%. Uh, for uh, if you just exclude aircraft here, you get to plus 0.1. So you're going from negative 13.7. We just exclude aircraft plus 0.1. So the biggest, the big culprit here is aircraft, negative 43.6. If we look at the other categories, they seem to be okay. Uh, let's go to the PMIs. Here is uh, U.S. Global Flash, U.S. Composite. You have uh, U.K., Eurozone. Uh, I think we have Germany in here, France, Japan is down at the bottom. Click on this. We can get uh, U.S. Composite PMI. Let's make this just a little bit bigger so we can see it. Uh, the Composite came in at 50.4. That is a six-month low. Uh, services came in at 51. That is a six-month low. Uh, and the manufacturing in contraction, 47.5, that's a two-month low. Uh, but services is really what has been holding things up. And it is coming down to the uh, neutral, uh, I shouldn't say maybe not neutral, uh, but at the 50 point, that's neither expansion nor contraction, uh, zero growth coming down to that point. And you can really see, uh, this is uh, the PMIs. Uh, from uh, after the pandemic, the massive increase, and then the slow bleed off going into 23. You had the rebound at the beginning of the year, and then the rollover in the last uh, uh, in the last few months. Coming down here, prices. Look at prices coming down. If you take this little cluster over here, and you go back to pre-pandemic, and you go back to 2018, uh, it kind of matches what's going on here with the services 
prices charged in 2018 being much higher than it is now. So this little cluster here, if you take the last quarter, let's say, uh, and you compare it to 2018-2019, um, inflation is home. It looks like inflation is in the range where it was prior to the pandemic. That if we extrapolate this forward, if we think this will continue going forward, I don't know why uh, we wouldn't expect inflation to continue to drift to the two percent uh, to the two percent target, uh, based on uh, what this chart is showing. U.S. manufacturing PMI straight down, straight down. Uh, there's the the 50 uh, mark right there. This was the pandemic. And then you had a brief party, and then it has been in contraction for some time. This is uh, PMI versus inflation. You could see that it tracks, uh, the, the inflation tracks PMI very closely, and we have PMIs that are dropping, uh, sort of support for suggesting that inflation would continue to drop. On, I believe it's Thursday, we get uh, US PCE. I see no reason why it wouldn't confirm the previous uh, CPI report. Uh, and this is um, versus gross domestic product, a little bit noisier in here. Uh, and we'll look at uh, GDP now. Uh, this is uh, GDP now. We're going to scroll down, click on the subcomponents contribution chart, go down to the second one. Uh, so uh, this is where we left off last time at 5.8%. Uh, and we had uh, existing home sales and new home sales. Existing home sales came in. Uh, negative, no surprise there. Uh, with entry with mortgage rates now over seven percent, you are certainly not going to sell your house to upgrade to another house if you have to get into another mortgage. You're just gonna you're just gonna stay put. Uh, so we can see the change total change in GDP forecast negative 0.03, uh, and the next day, uh, new home sales uh, brought it another 0 0.07. So the combination of those two was 0.1. So we went from 5.8 to 5.7. And then you see advanced census manufacturing M31. And you're probably thinking, well, what is that? That's durable goods. Remember, I pointed it out. That is the official technical name of that report. But everyone just knows it as the durable goods report. Uh, that uh, increased. Total change in GDP forecast 0.24. Change in private inventories up 0.23 which may seem counterintuitive at first when you say, well, hang on a second, if it was negative 5.2, how can it contribute to that growth? Uh, most of that, almost all of that was in aircraft. If you take aircraft out, most of the other categories were showing growth uh, month over month. They were uh, showing growth. So we have a change in private inventories of 0.23. GDP now forecast at 5.9%. Okay. Let's uh, just uh, briefly discuss Powell on Friday, a 14-minute speech, uh, almost twice as long as last year, and less uh, lectury. He didn't wag his finger at the market. Uh, acknowledges that inflation is showing some progress, uh, but that there's more work to be done, something he said um, every time he speaks. Broke inflation down into three buckets like he does every time. Goods, he puts a check mark. Housing, he says uh, he feels there will be a check mark. It's just a matter of time. And services X housing is not showing the um, progress that they would like to see. Uh, while it is coming down, it's not coming down fast enough. Then he said that getting it to 2%, and 2% is the target, he said. We're not changing it. It is 2%, period, full stop, end of story, move on. It's 2%. Getting it to 2% will require a period of below trend growth. While Q1 was above trend, Q2 was above trend. We get another look at Q2 this week. And GDP now is now 5.9%, which is more than triple the trend growth rate. More than triple the trend growth rate. This is just a shocking number. I, I, still, I still have... Uh, uh, a sneaking suspicion in my mind that the model is not capturing something, that there's some distortion in there and it can't possibly be 5.9% because if it is, 
at these level of interest rates, at 5.5% on the Fed funds, at over 7% on a mortgage rate, if we're still expecting triple the trend growth rate, uh, then the interest rate is simply not a variable that needs to be considered uh, because that is crazy growth. Uh, even in good times, that would be, uh, and when I say good times, very accommodative policy, very accommodative policy. That would be incredible growth to get, get to a very tight labor market with very high interest rates, uh, restrictive credit, uh, and still pull out 5.9 out of that hat. It's uh, Could it be the model is... Is picking up something that uh, that's causing it to say it should be this when it's maybe the other way? I don't know. Anyways, uh, getting inflation down is going to require uh, a period of below trend growth, and we haven't seen that at all this year, yet inflation has been coming down. A little bit of a head scratcher. You sort of wonder if this, if economics is really just a whole bunch of uh, uh, people trying to make, uh, trying to find patterns in randomness. Money market rates uh, all up, starting to reflect uh, the possibility of another rate hike by the end of the year. If we look at the three-month, 5.61, 11 basis points above the upper range, 5.59 on the four-month, 5.61 on the six-month. And when we look at the probabilities uh, for December uh, for the FOMC, we see that the probabilities have all shifted upwards Again, uh, two weeks ago they shifted up, last week they shifted down, this week they shifted up. So we're oscillating between no more rate hikes and one more rate hike. No more rate hikes and one more rate hike. And this Friday we get the jobs report. If that thing comes in strong, then uh, yeah, probabilities will shift to one more rate hike. Uh, and week over week, long end of the curve, 10, 20s, 30s uh, dropped uh, while the front end uh, from the 2 to the 7 increased. But that sort of hides the volatility that we had last week. Monday uh, was an ugly day for bonds. Tuesday was a beautiful day for bonds. Uh, look at uh, look at the the uh, cycle highs that we hit last week. Uh, on Friday, uh, the three month, the four month, the six month all hit cycle highs. And earlier in the week, Monday and Tuesday, you had the uh, three year, uh, the five year, the seven year, the ten year, the twenty, and the thirty all hit cycle highs. The 20 and the 30 did it on Monday, and the 3 to the 10s uh, hit their cycle high on Tuesday on a closing basis. And the 2-year at 503 is threatening the uh, the March uh, cycle high uh, at 5.05. Uh, 4.45 on Monday, and by Friday it was 4.3, a drop of 15 basis points for the week. On Monday I bought more uh, of the 2048 uh, I got the 2048, and I was buying it. I think it was about 4.61%. Uh, and it was frustrating on Monday, especially after the week before, the big uh, uh, sell-off in bonds. And it, then it continued again on Monday, and I thought, well, where is everyone going? So you're getting out of your, your U.S. Treasuries because, oh, my God, uh, there was a credit uh, downgrade, and uh, there's a lot of issuance coming, and, yeah, we have deficits. I, I got I to gotta go to someplace safer, and you sell your bonds, and you say, okay, where am I going to go now? Where are you going to go? On a, uh, on a relative basis, where are you going to go? If, if the safe house is on fire, everything's on fire. There's no place to go. Everything is simply just riskier. So where are you going to go? Uh, and I think on Tuesday, it became clear that, you know, maybe this has gone a little too far. And it was a big day in bonds on Tuesday. I don't know for those of you watching uh, the uh, the bond market and the 30-year. Just a big day in bonds. TLT was up some $2 uh, that day alone. Uh, for the type of clientele that buys the long bond, uh, big in insurance companies, especially the 20-year, 30-year, really big there, life insurance, because they have very long-dated liabilities that have to grow at a certain percentage. To be able to grab 4 4.5%, 4.6% yields <clears throat> and lock that in, uh, job done. Uh, there must have been, you know, uh, an afternoon party uh, on Monday uh, uh, when yields hit that low, thinking, okay, Tuesday, we're coming in and, and job done, and we're going to take the, the next 10 years off. 
Uh, certainly on Tuesday, we had a, a really nice day. Uh, I bought on Monday, and I was actually very excited about buying, even though uh, TLT was going down, even though the uh, value of the bonds were going down. I was very excited because I'm, I'm thinking about this over the long term to be able to lock that in along with a big duration kicker on that. Keep in mind, I'm getting a, a, a 4.61 yield with a duration kicker. Uh, and at some point, rates are coming down. So I get paid quite well to wait. Um, the inversion, negative 12 on the 2 to 10 was uh, almost at negative 66, now down to 0.78, so we're getting a flattener, not the dreaded bear steepener everyone was thinking we were going to have. Yields are going to be 6% uh, on the long end, and uh, we're getting a, a flattener. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to oscillate week after week between uh, flattening, steepening, flattening, steepening. But I think that is more likely than a prolonged term of steepening. I think it is more likely that we get that than we start moving, you know, the 30-year starts moving towards 5%, then 5 and a half, then 6% uh, on, on, uh, on that. I think, I think that, the volatility at this level, is more likely. Uh, the uh, three month to the 10 year from 129 to 136, uh, down seven basis points. Balance sheet runoff continues, and uh, this, this here is uh, contributing to higher yields at the long end uh, because they're letting their coupon bonds run off and not replenishing them. So there's a buyer out of the market for an incremental $45 billion a month. Uh, along with what the Treasury is issuing each month, uh, does help explain uh, some of the increase in yields. Uh, so the balance sheet down 6.6 .6 billion. The SOMA was down 4.3 roughly, so roughly 2.4 was uh, uh, runoff beyond what uh, the planned runoff was. Money market funds decreased. Uh, we've been seeing increase, increase, increase. We've got a decrease, small one, $1.09 billion, but not from retail. Retail still continues to come in. Institutional down 10.19. Government down $8.2 billion. Uh, if I had to bet where this money went, uh, I would bet that it went into duration, into the long end of the curve, because starting on Tuesday, again, uh, Tuesday was a big day on bonds. Friday was a was a decent day as well, uh, but a big day on bonds. They move into duration. I would seem to think that the money there, which is on the short end of the curve, is sitting, when we say money market funds, it's sitting over here, probably moved in uh, over here. We are entering into another jobs week. Uh, we have the jobs report on Friday, which is five days. Tuesday, we get jolts. Wednesday, the always wrong ADP. Thursday, initial claims. Friday, we get the jobs report. Uh, 24 days away from the next FOMC meeting. It's on September 20th. And we have PC, uh, PCE uh, for July in four days. The probabilities of zero uh, move in September are 80% down from 89% and 20% uh, on the 25 the more important uh, probabilities are December 13th. I don't think anyone's expecting any move in September. I, I think this is the right thing. But for December, it's mixed. 5.5 uh, is no move. Last week, it had a weighting of almost 60%. Now it's dropped to 44.5. And one move up to 5.75, increased from 29% to 45%. And you even had... Uh, almost a tripling of the probabilities on 6% from 2.7 to 8.5. So the market, I think, is going to oscillate this way between one more hike versus no more hikes, versus one more hike versus no more hikes. But one thing that they all agree on is no rate cuts by the end of the year. We're going to look at the Fed funds futures. We're going to see that, that, that all the way into February, uh, it is showing no rate cuts. It's basically a flat line. Effective federal funds rate still sitting at 533. Look at that reverse repo down below 1.7 trillion now, 1.68 down 131 billion with the yields where they are. You're getting 533 in here. You can get more than that uh, in the uh, in the one month is 5.56. A three month is 5.61. 
So you're doing a lot better in the uh, in in government money market securities and T bills than you are in the reverse repo. So money is flowing back out. Looking at our lags, they haven't really changed much uh, here. Uh, Twelve month lag. Uh, the effective federal funds rate 12 months ago was 2.33. So if we uh, are thinking that there are lags, that means there's still 300 basis points to hit, only 233 on a weighted average across the economy, let's say, uh, have hit. A lot of, uh, I've said this before, a lot of companies have derivatives in place uh, to insulate them against interest rate moves so uh, that, that they're rather immune to these sort of interest rate uh, uh, moves, especially over this short period of time. It's only over a one-year period of time. But as each week goes by, um, more and more of those derivatives need to be rolled over. Uh, and they roll over at the higher and higher rates. That as, again, as each week goes by, more and more of that weighs uh, on the economy. So to say that there are no lags, and this is what I have heard, that, that there are probably no lags, that, that all the effect is in the economy, I disagree with that uh, quite a bit. Real yields this week all set a new cycle high uh, on Monday. Uh, the 10, the 20, the 30, uh, 30 year real yields, all with new cycle highs on Tuesday. The 5 and the 7 year uh, hit new cycle highs. Still have an inversion from the 5 to the 10, 27 basis point uh, inversion. For the break even rates, small changes, 1, 2, 3 basis points. We can call that basically unchanged week over week. The Fed funds futures. Look at how flat this curve is getting here. November, December, January, all pretty much coming in at the same rate. Implied Last week's implied rate on January was 5.405. Now it's 5.485, an increase of 8 basis points on the January implied rate. Going out to the end of the first quarter of 2024, we were uh, implying 5.29, now 5.415, an increase of 12.5 basis points. And going to the end of the second quarter of 2024, 4.995 to 5.17, an increase of 17.5 basis points. So we are flattening out that curve, implying uh, either one more rate or at, at what, what seems to be fairly uh, um, solid here is no rate cuts. Going through all of December, December 24, December 23, negative 110 basis points. Last week was negative 116. About a month ago, this was sitting around one negative 130. A couple months before that, negative 150. So we've gone from about six rate cuts through 2024 to roughly four rate cuts. And I think this will continue uh, to uh, move towards zero. Let's have a look at TLT. Look at these moves on TLT. Uh, there is uh, Tuesday. Uh, let's get something that writes on there. There's Tuesday. There's Wednesday. Big moves up. I'm sure many people holding TLT were thankful for that. The yields I felt on Monday over here had just gone too far. It's like you're selling, but where, where, where do you possibly think you're going? TLT for the week 155, SPY 0.8. On uh, Monday, I did sell some TLT. Uh, for a loss and then moved that into the 2048 bonds. Uh, I picked those up at 76.15. Friday they closed at 78.03. Uh, so here's what I've done uh, with TLT. Uh, I took an actual loss uh, on uh, uh, some position on TLT. So uh, for me, uh, that is a tax savings. I'm going to have a tax savings because of that. But TLT holds an average maturity uh, uh, the average maturity of their portfolio is 25 years, and that's how they get their duration of 17.6. So if you buy a 25-year treasury, you should be able to match the duration. Uh, holding the treasury directly gets you roughly, right now, about a, well, when I bought it, 4.61 on the 25-year dividend yield on TLT going forward would have been about 3.4. You're getting about 120 basis points higher on your yield. Uh, and you're realizing a loss and moving into the exact same security. Basically, I shouldn't say the exact same security. You're moving into an extremely identical security. 
but in doing so, it is a different security. So for tax purposes, you get a loss, uh, which has a tax benefit, but you haven't abandoned the trade. You've just take, taken, you've just replicated it in another security. So there's nothing but a win for me in there uh, by harvesting that loss uh, for tax purposes in this particular year and smuggling it into uh, the 25-year Treasury bond. Now, when I do leave Canada, uh, I will have to pay any gain in here. It's called a deemed disposition. So I will have to pay uh, any capital gain uh, that appears within that security uh, when I do finally leave Canada. So it's my hope uh, that bonds will be under pressure until I leave, such that there is no gain in there, uh, that once I leave, please, let's have my gain now, uh, and my destination, there won't be any tax on that gain. Uh, what I don't want to see is this rally like nothing else into the end of the year so that my deemed position, deemed disposition, suddenly has this huge capital gain where I will have to pay uh, the socialist tax rate we have here in Canada, but I am getting my tax savings here. So I am uh, hoping that we have this oscillation on the long end of the curve from flattening to steepening to flattening to steepening uh, for the next uh, maybe a quarter, maybe two quarters, that would be nice. It would serve my purposes to have it uh, you know, under pressure for a long period of time. Now that I've said it, now that that's out in the universe, the universe is making notes saying, okay, okay, that's, that's what would benefit you? Okay, let me see what we can do about making sure that doesn't happen. Okay, let's move uh, to housing, and we'll spend some time here this week um, talking about uh, the question of whether or not housing prices are in a bubble. Primary mortgage market survey. Look at this uh, fixed rate mortgage, 7.23%. It is a 52-week high. It is a cycle high, up 14 basis points from last week. Um, the 10-year treasury Thursday over Thursday, because this is as of the 24th, was down 7 basis points. This is up 14. The spread has increased 21 basis points. And we talk about the spread moving up, moving down week over week. Let's put it in context here. Uh, the total spread now is 300 basis points. Between the 30-year fixed rate mortgage and the 10-year U.S. Treasury, the total spread is 300 basis points. A typical spread is about 175 basis points. So this spread is extremely wide, and this spread will filter over into the MBS as well. Uh, so agency MBS, I think, is, is screaming by at this point. Uh, the spread, not only are rates elevated, but the spread is elevated as well. Uh, agency Annaly and ABR all uh, put out a gain this week. Uh, after the punishing losses it had the week before. Um, and this is directly related to the long end of the curve. Uh, yields uh, moving down on the long end of the curve. Home builders, uh, well, it goes without saying that they should be taking a hit, right? 7.23% mortgages. What's the future going to look like? So they are all taking a hit. I would like to see them continue their downward move so I can buy them because I do think that they don't just have one or two quarters ahead of them. Uh, I think they have several years ahead of them of, of outperformance. Uh, Toll Brothers had earnings, so uh, they still uh, pulled out a gain, and earnings were good. I, don't, I can't remember in the last three quarters if any of the home builders missed. Hovnanian, a uh, little bit of a gain. I saw it under 90 this week, I saw it at about 89, and it was printing 89 and change, and I thought, ah, I should grab that, and I thought, well, I'll probably have a better opportunity, and it closed the day at 94. Opened in the morning, saw about 89, closed the day at 94, I thought, ah, it's such a volatile stock with no options, that's the crime, no options on this beautiful volatile stock. The implied volatility on this would be off the charts. You, you pretty much have to buy this thing, but man, does it move. Uh, REITs, IYR, PLD, DLR, DLR primarily uh, uh, a um, recipient of NVIDIA's earnings. Uh, and if you look at their revenue over the last, let's say, six, seven quarters, 
uh, you'll see it's really only the data centers. Really, it's only the data center revenue. All their other categories are meh, meh, nothing to talk about. It's data center. And on the call, uh, there were some questions about visibility of demand on, on the data center. Um, I think two or three analysts were, were asking, you know, like, sure, you've got this going on now, but you know, at some point this will be built, right? Like what kind of visibility do you have on demand, you know, going out, you know, three, four quarters or going out two? I think one asked what visibility do you have going out two years? And I think the answer was into next year we have visibility. So two, three quarters. Uh, but once this is built out, when you look at the other segments they have, this is, this is the whole story is data centers, is, is what, they're, what the revenue they're generating in, in the data center category. Not gaming, not PCs. Uh, um, there's some building in uh, data visualization. Uh, it looks like good growth, but it's such low revenue. It's under 500 million, uh, the category. I think 325 it came in for the quarter. Up significantly from the previous quarter, but certainly not justifying over a trillion dollar valuation. So the, the real question is, okay, you're exploding because of this one category right here, data centers. You're exploding because of that. But at some point, everyone will have their chips. At some point, other chips will be on the market. So that was a valid question is what's the visibility do you have? Do you see this as a 10 year thing or do you see this as a three quarter thing? Uh, and, um, you know, if you uh, study rhetoric at all, rhetoric is you listen to what people say and then you ask, well, why did you say that as opposed to saying something else? Why did you say that? So it's not really what you're saying to me, but why you're saying what you're saying to me. I want you to listen to NVIDIA's call with that question in mind and listen to the first 10 minutes of that call. Uh, and they spent time laying out all the markets that are going to experience this massive growth. There's this market and that market and this market's going and these models are doing this and companies are doing this and that and moving. They spent a lot of time justifying uh, uh, or building up rhetorically a market into which they will sell. So from a rhetorical perspective, when you look at that, you say, well, why are you spending so much time on that? And it's because that's the story right now. That's the story. So you've got to feed the monster. That's the story. And I think the market, uh, if you look at uh, the performance of NVIDIA, uh, it popped on the news. It got as high as 520 after hours. And then the next day, it opened up high and then sold off and then ended the week negative. Ended the week negative because... Uh, there is probably not enough quarters ahead for data center growth to justify the whole company. So you have to start looking at the other revenue streams of the company and you look at gaming, you look at PCs and you say, eh, you know, okay, but eh, it's data centers. Uh, so DLR is a recipient of that. Uh, the home builder indexes uh, pulled back as well. That's no surprise. What happened last week? Existing home sales for July negative 2.2% month over month. Mortgage applications dropped another 4.2%. New home sales up 4.4%. This Tuesday, we'll get uh, the uh, HPI index, housing pricing index, plus Case Shiller uh, housing price index. And Wednesday, we get pending home sales. Um, I. Uh, had uh, dinner with uh, a uh, a person this week, a charter holder uh, who lives in Toronto, and he was explaining, you know, I've got a good income, my wife has a good income, but we can't buy a house. And when I lived uh, in uh, the Toronto region, um, I was looking at housing prices, and this is going back to 2014, 2015, looking at housing prices. I'm a single person with a professor's salary, and I thought if I had to rely on just my salary to buy a house, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, and I have a good salary. That you needed two salaries, and even then you would probably exceed 40% of your income in, in just housing costs. You'd be somewhere around 60, 70, 80%. Uh, depending on where you want to move to, that will dictate the price of the house that you pay. Canadian Bank a couple of weeks ago, put out a report 
that, uh, can, that housing is in an extreme bubble. And we've heard this before, housing is in a bubble. The average person simply can't afford to buy a home. Um, well, is housing in a bubble? Uh, or are wages in an inverse bubble? Uh, just imagine what a bubble is and then invert it. Um, if, if we accept that housing is in a bubble, prices have to come down. Hard to conceive of how prices can come down. So let me get some real estate here and I'll just describe to you uh, the realities of building an 1800 square foot house. Uh, you have to buy some land. You need land to build on and how it starts is you'll have this plot of undeveloped land. Uh, let's say it's 10 acres. And then builders will build a bid on this lot. Gone are the days where you could buy farmland for $6,500 an acre. That's gone. That's gone. Uh, uh, you're not going to get that. You're probably going to be somewhere around $150,000 an acre uh, on buying farmland. Uh, because there's just, at least in this area, there just is no place, uh, no place uh, to build. There's so many restrictions on where you can build. Uh, and the good land has basically been built on. So you're, you're, you're going to continue to buy marginal land uh, where you're going to have some areas in here uh, that have natural water on it. Well, that's a natural wetland. You can't touch it. You're going to have some tree stands in certain areas where uh, they're going to come in. And when you buy land, you have to have, uh, they come in, uh, government agencies come in and they count the trees and they say, you can cut down these over here, but you can't touch these. Uh, and if you're going to develop land, uh, you're going to need roads coming in and you got to give the city those roads. And so you'll lose roughly 30% of your land uh, in roads. So let's say that you have a clean property, uh, uh, clean 10 acres. You're going to get seven acres uh, on that. And let's say that you're going to build quarter acre lots, uh, decent size lots. Uh, you can get a minimum of 28, uh, 28 houses uh, in there. So if you're paying 150,000 or 1.5 million uh, for this and you're getting 28 houses in there, uh, you can see exactly what the price, the raw price of land is. Well, you've got to develop this land now. You've got to develop uh, that land. Uh, so you can multiply this by two. By the time you're done developing, you'll be somewhere around uh, three million uh, on developing, somewhere around there, um, if not a little bit higher. Interest rates are sitting at about uh, well for developers. Uh, where's the uh, uh, the two year sitting at about uh, five percent? Add another four hundred basis points on for a good developer. They're paying nine percent to carry to carry this debt. So you're going to have the interest costs on that, and to get it from land to full development, about two years. Uh, that's the reality of getting it there. So you're going to be somewhere around three to three and a half million by the time you're done developing these ten acres uh, and you get it ready for build. And if you have uh, twenty eight properties on there. If you take the three million and divide it by twenty-eight, you're gonna be somewhere around one hundred and ten thousand dollars, and that's no margin. That's just cost. That's just developer cost. That's it, and that's if you can get. Uh, uh, that's if you have clean, clean land. You can cut down all the trees. There's no water on this land. You're gonna ease thirty percent uh, to the city. Your development costs will come in in line, and you can get it done in two years. So your interest cost is somewhere between three and three point five. You'll be between one ten and one twenty with zero profit. That's just your book cost. So you're going to put these out somewhere around two hundred thousand. So there you go. Before you even build a house, your two hundred thousand. If you're going to build an eighteen hundred square foot house. Uh, the easiest way to think about it is is uh, building on cost per square foot. About two thirds, two thirds of the uh, price of a house in North America, Canada, and the U.S. is labor, and labor costs have been going up. About two thirds is uh, the cost of of labor, and then you have materials in there. Uh, gone are the days of building a house for one hundred and fifty dollars a square foot. 
that's that's gone. Anybody who's ever built a house who's listening probably would say 150. You, you would have to build uh, a sixplex if you're trying to get your average cost down that low. But to build a standalone house, uh, to get it down to 150 a square foot, you're either using illegal labor to get that done or the cheapest possible material you can possibly find. Uh, $200, I would say, would be a stretch to the low end. But let's say that you stretch it down to $200 a square foot at 1,800 uh, square feet. And there's $360,000. You're $560,000 on basically a three-bedroom, two-bathroom, unfinished basement house with builder kitchen and builder bathrooms, builder doors. When I say builder kitchen, builder bathrooms... This is, it's not low-end stuff, but it's not mid-end stuff. It's somewhere between mid to low-end stuff. It's the very basic toilets you'll get, the very basic countertops, cabinets, sinks, uh, very basic tiling, just builder stuff. Hollow doors, that kind of thing. If you want any upgrades from that, uh, any upgrade above your $3,000 appliance budget, which would be a builder appliance budget, uh, you're going to go up from $200. Uh, 250 is probably uh, more likely. You'll be somewhere around uh, 250. That adds 90,000. You're 650k min. 650k. You still don't have a finished a finished basement. If you want a more upscale home, well, you're not going to buy uh, 1,800 square feet. You're probably going to build somewhere around 2,500 square feet. It's probably going to cost you about $300 a square foot. There, 750k. Uh, but you're not going to build that in a neighborhood uh, with 1,800 square foot homes. You're going to build it in a significant neighborhood. You're going to pay more than 200,000 for your lot. You're probably going to pay 300,000 up. There's one million. It's hard to conceive of where you're going to get property prices coming down because of the replacement costs. Labor costs what labor costs, and that's two thirds of a house. Unless you're going to use illegal labor, you're not going to get it down. The more land you develop, the more you have to buy marginal land. The good land is built on. You have to continually buy marginal land, which means you're not going to get 70% usage because, again, you have to cede 30% of it to the municipality. You've got to build roads, and those roads don't belong to you anymore. Once you're done servicing that lot, that 30% of that 30% roughly goes to the municipality. And if you're lucky on that land, there's nothing else sitting there that you can use the rest of it. If you want to get lower cost housing, you can't have quarter acre lots. You've got to uh, build for density. And if you build for density, well then you're targeting a lower income strata of society when you're building for density because people who have uh, the money don't want to live in crowded neighborhoods. They want, they want space between houses. So again, when you look at all of this, it is difficult to conceive of how you can get uh, these prices down uh, from where they are based on what replacement cost would be. So perhaps it's not housing that's in a bubble, perhaps it's wages, or said a little bit better, not so much wages, but the share of wages in GDP that is in an inverse bubble. Okay, let's look at these... Uh two charts. The top one is corporate profits after tax uh, over GDP. So it's the percentage of GDP that would be uh, wrapped up in corporate profits after tax. Now here is the compensation of employees, wages and salary accruals to GDP. And we'll look at the pre-1980 period and the post-1990 period. The 1980s was a turning point uh, for a few things. But previous to 1980, there was a very negative correlation, a very high negative correlation uh, between these two data series that uh, when um, you were uh, above trend line uh, on corporate profits as a percent of GDP, you tended to be below trend line uh, on wages and salaries. And you could see this drop off over here. Uh, this was sort of a transfer. You know, corporations are showing lower profitability because labor is getting paid more. More of the returns are going to labor than capital.
because corporate profits, what you have left over on that profit is purely a return to capital. Uh, why do I say that? Well, you have your revenues minus your expenses. You, your salaries are in your expenses. What you have left over is what you have left over after paying labor. So it must be the return to capital. Uh, that is why uh, over here at you, I write, you can either have return on capital or return on labor. Corporate profits are part of return on capital. So if labor is getting a larger share of national income, um, you would naturally expect that it would come out of corporate profits, and that was the relationship until not about 1980. Uh, you can see here corporate profits surging. You can see here uh, labor share of, uh, of GDP dropping as a uh, corporate profit share of GDP rises. It was a very tight relationship. Uh, let's look after 1990. You sort of have the same thing going on here. You look at this uh, relationship you have here, then you had this run up, you had this run down, and then it held at this higher level and it held at this lower level. That correlation is back in there. Something changed in the 80s, which changed the levels of these two it seems, or at least it set up the, the, the foundation to change the levels in these two, but not the relationship because negative correlation post pre-1980 and post-1990. Um, the mean reverting level for corporate profits is a share of GDP for 50 years, basically all the way to 2000 here for 50 years was about 6%. And then you had this uh, move up to 10%, just this move with no return. And it kind of looks like we're sitting at a new level here. Labor was about 50%, right? So think about it this way. I have a cab and I send the cab out and it generates $1,000 in revenue and I pay the driver $500. That means the car itself earned the other $500. That was sort of the split. 50% mean reverting uh, level for return on labor. Uh, and then uh, here it looks like we have a new level down at 43.5. So the 50 has dropped to 43.5 and the 6% has increased to 10%, widening the spread. What happened in the 1980s? Uh, late 70s, early 80s, you had a hollowing out of the textile industry in uh, northern, uh, uh, northern U.S. Uh, moved to South America primarily. The emergence of the Rust Belt steel uh, companies just shutting down factories. Uh, even the popular culture reflected that. If you um, Google or go to YouTube and uh, search for a Billy Joel so song called Allentown, and it really is about what was going on at that time. Uh, is the loss, the massive loss of manufacturing jobs from Detroit uh, through Cleveland all the way out to, in, into Pennsylvania. That's why it was called the Rust Belt. The emergence of the Rust Belt, significant loss of manufacturing, uh, and uh, it became more difficult for a single income to maintain a household. You had the rise of dual income households. Uh, and in the 80s, this is where you, we first heard the term yuppie young upwardly mobile professional and households were referred to as dinks <laughs> sounds funny right dinks d-i-n-k-s uh, that you had the rise of the dinks and i know i know the joke in there uh, dual income no kids that was a thing in the 80s that was that was part of the social fabric going on the change in the social fabric in the 80s was this young upwardly mobile professional and dual income uh, households with no kids because that's what started to sort of be needed uh, to to um, for affordability because look what was going on through here like I mean you're, you're moving from 50 percent almost straight down to 43.5 percent and as far as capital is going, uh, as opposed to uh, thinking about returns on real capital, it, there was a real shift throughout the 80s to return on financial capital. Uh, that started to take a larger share of the earnings in GDP was that return on financial assets. Uh, so the question I have here, we've gone from 6% and it appears to be a permanent shift up to 10% more, and this again is return on capital, more return on capital. 
labor taking a hit down 43.5 from 50 percent so the spread between the return on capital and the return on labor is widening is the spread the bubble All right i don't think if you think about the fundamentals of housing it makes sense where are we going to get the cost down well you can get the price of land down where you're not manufacturing more land if if the easy land to build on has been built on each plot you buy is marginally more expensive to build on further out from the city center requiring more expensive servicing to get done less of the area can be built on because of certain uh, certain things that are on the land you could point to regulation well we need to reduce regulation we can get that down uh, as well um, what about the cost of labor? What about the cost of materials? Uh, you know, you can only build a house so small and so cheap before it's really not worth it. So I don't know that the price is in a bubble because I think the price is truly reflecting the fundamentals. A bubble is where the price has become completely detached from the fundamentals. So in 1999, when you looked at the dot-coms and everyone was telling you revenue doesn't matter, it's eyeballs, uh, the price was completely detached from the fundamentals. Uh, but not for housing. Housing is not a bubble. You have unaffordable housing, but you don't have bubble prices because the price of the house is completely attached to the fundamentals yet it's unaffordable so it cannot we cannot point to housing and say there's the bubble where if so if there's no bubble there there must be an inverse bubble somewhere else and my question here and it's open for debate is the spread the bubble so let's uh, just jump back to housing and what we think is going to go on uh, with housing here uh, as i said i don't think housing prices are in a bubble because a bubble requires the pricing to be completely detached from the fundamentals right now pricing is attached to the fundamentals so if you want to affect pricing you must affect the fundamentals you must make land more abundant which means land that you cannot build on right now so ontario has something called the green belt you can't build anywhere on that green belt well you got to get rid of that if you have national parks well you got to get rid of that uh, you, you have to make land more available. Eh, I don't see that uh, being a viable option going forward. Number two to change the fundamentals is you got to remove a lot of regulation. you got to say, look, if there's water on the property or natural wetlands, why can't I clear it away? If there's a tree frog or a, a snake, why can't I just re replace it somewhere else? You have to really shorten the amount of regulation uh, shorten, reduce the amount of regulation to shorten the development period of time to lower the cost of developing land. So if you can make land far more abundant, you'll drive the price down. If you can remove regulation and shorten the time it takes to develop the land, you'll drive the development costs down. Now you have to do something with demand. And raising interest rates I don't think is the appropriate way because you're going to have pent-up demand, always the pent-up demand. You have to solve the demand problem, which means reduce immigration to a trickle. You've got to get the rate of household formation so very low that even a lower level of supply would still overwhelm that demand. You have to change the fundamentals in that housing market because the prices are attached to the fundamentals. You want lower pricing, you got to change the fundamentals. I don't see much of that happening. I don't see... Uh, a whole bunch of land opening up for development. I see the land that does come on for development being marginal each and every time. The yield that you're getting out of each uh, each property is lower and lower because the cost, the further you go from the city center, the cost of development begin to increase uh, because you have to, perhaps the land that you bought is 100 meters away from the junctions. And so you have to, you have to uh, build all of that out. It's easier as a, a city is expanding if you can buy land that is contiguous, right? But if you've got to buy something out here, well, you need a road that's built there. You've got to bring all of your utility services out to that piece of land so it becomes more and more expensive to get done. I don't see that happening for quite some time, which means that it is going to be a home builder's market for a long time, uh, years in fact. 
Uh, so I think the home builders uh, are not just uh, celebrating what's going on at this point in time. I think the conditions are here uh, for three, four year run on home builder, uh, on home builder success. So uh, I, I am very interested uh, in the home builders on any significant pullback. I don't think the pullback has been significant enough yet. Uh, I would love to see DHI uh, breach 105, maybe even 100. That would be nice. I would, I would find that to be an extremely great buying opportunity because this is not a two, three-quarter thing or, or, or maybe even a four-quarter thing. Like I think NVIDIA is probably a three or four-quarter thing. It's not, a, it's not a five-year thing, but I think housing has the real potential to be that. Okay, um, some comments were pointing out that I didn't do an SPY section for the last two weeks. So let's revisit that and we'll spend some time here. Uh, we'll look at two different uh, models uh, of how we can uh, think about the market over the next 12 months. Uh, and for you level three candidates, I think you'll find this uh, a very applied from the capital market expectations reading to this. Forward four quarter operating earnings. Uh, S&P Global is putting it at 229.31. IBES got it at 232.80. Uh, so you either have a 19.2 times forward earnings or 18.9. I took the average of the two to get 19.05, closing SPX 44.05. I am looking at the December 15th 4600 call. It's sitting at 70 bucks. I wanted to sell the 4600 calls last week, but after Nvidia reported, uh, I saw the move after the market and I thought this is probably going to follow through on uh, Thursday and Friday. Let me wait. I did not think uh, it would fade away that quickly because the market has shown itself unwilling uh, to engage in rational thinking. Uh, and, and to just to buy into a story. So I thought, well, it'll continue to buy into that story. Well, guess what? Now it's trying to come off as rational. Uh, but I am looking at the December uh, the uh, December 15th expiration for the options, the 4,600 strike, and I'm going to re-enter my short position, but at that level. Uh, but I want better premiums than that. Uh, so I will wait to see what happens uh, in the market going into, uh, now that we've got pretty much everything out of the way, uh, in terms of we've seen Powell, we've got this earnings season out of the way. We have an idea that inflation is where it is, but coming down, coming down a little slower. We think the Fed is pretty much done, maybe one more. Let's see how the market holds up on this one. Uh, inverse of this, earnings yield 5.25%. One-year Treasury 5.44, two-year 5.03. And there's your earnings yield at 5.25%. Uh, yes, it does have risk. Uh, it is a distribution uh, that has a right tail so that you, you know, there's something, yeah, but it has capital gain uh, potential. It also has the other side of the distribution, which is capital loss uh, potential. This does not. So when you look at the competitiveness of those two yields, 5.25 with a wide distribution or 5.44 with no distribution, what do you want? That's, that's why we compare the yields is... One has no distribution, one has a wide distribution. Is 5.25%, the middle of the distribution being lower than, than the one-year yield, is that median, uh, or the middle of that distribution enough for you to accept 19 basis points lower on the yield, knowing that 50% of that distribution will be worse, right? Implied volatility still elevated, 13 week at 78%. Uh, let's think about uh, forecasting going forward from where we are now. Uh, and let's think about a forecast for real GDP. Uh, for forecast for real GDP, we can use uh, two things, growth in labor inputs added to growth in labor productivity. That should give us an idea of what real GDP growth is. Add your expected inflation onto that, you'll get a forecast for nominal GDP for the next four quarters. Growth from labor inputs, we're seeing uh, labor force uh, participation rate just not changing. You have low levels of immigration, low levels of population growth. I'm saying, uh, you know, as far as a contribution to real GDP, your growth from labor inputs, uh, you can write that off and it'd be small, point zero to maybe point zero, maybe point zero five, but I don't think the point zero five 
I think zero, unless you can get labor force participation rate to increase significantly and population growth to increase significantly. Those are the two subcomponents of labor inputs is population growth and participation rate. Participation rate is flat <clears throat> and it has, it has over the last 15 years been dropping and it is sitting flat right now. I don't see that. I don't see that improving because of the uh, demographics of the uh, of, of the population. And immigration is just a hot button issue right now that I don't think any politician wants to touch. So you got to get it from labor productivity. We only saw positive labor productivity on the last report. Pre previous to that, uh, labor productivity has been negative, and only the last report has been positive. If you get labor productivity what you're getting is more output for the same input. That's deflationary. So if we think that growth in labor productivity lies ahead of us, uh, that is deflationary. You look at GDP now at 5.9%, and you say, okay, well, 5.9%, how much of that is coming from labor inputs? How much from uh, labor productivity? I think nothing is coming from labor inputs, so it must all be coming from labor productivity. And if it's all coming from labor productivity, that is deflationary, so that our uh, measure of expected inflation going forward should be closer to the 2%. So if you think about nominal GDP, our components are roughly about zero from labor inputs, plus something from labor productivity, plus 2% from um, uh, expected inflation. So it appears that uh, the attractiveness of the U.S. market all rests at least uh, from my small analysis here, seems to primarily rest on labor productivity. If labor productivity shows up, then you've got something. If labor productivity doesn't show up, well, where are you getting growth from? Because it's not coming from labor inputs. Where are you getting real GDP growth from? Where are you getting that 5.9% from? It cannot be from labor inputs. I just can't see how it is. So it has to be, it has to be labor productivity. Now, you've had negative productivity for quite some time uh, that maybe this is a return to a level of productivity that you should have because you had undershot productivity for so long. To get back to trend growth in productivity, you'd have to have a period of over, uh, uh, um, of, uh, you know, huge productivity gains to get there. And if that is the case, if we are getting 5.9 primarily from this component of real GDP, that is deflationary because it is more output for the same input. In other words, my labor costs aren't going up, but my output is increasing. That's productivity. Productivity is when your unit labor costs are decreasing. That means that I can still pay my staff more, but the production, the productive capacity increases by much more such that they, my labor cost in each unit has been decreasing. That is deflationary. So is this 5.9%? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Is this 5.9%, this triple trend growth, does it have within itself deflationary forces? Is the Fed wrong saying we require a period of below trend growth? Maybe they don't require a period of below trend growth. Maybe another thing they could say is we require a period of above trend labor productivity. Huh? Think about that. Wouldn't that do it? Instead of a period of 1.4, 1.5% growth, because if you have that, what a company is going to do? Cut back supply. I mean, that, that to me makes perfect sense. You'd cut back supply. Maybe as counterintuitive as it seems, maybe this is the way out. If, if this comes from labor productivity, it's an interesting experiment uh, for your mind to go through, right? That, that if, we, if we conclude that it's not coming from labor inputs, it must come from labor productivity. If, in fact, we believe this to be true, it must be deflationary rates uh, or inflation would be coming down, the Fed's done. The, this 5.9 could mean the Fed's done. The Fed's done. We'll see. Another way of uh, thinking about how the market uh, will look like over the next year uh, is an expansion of a Gordon growth model into a short-term model. This is called Grinold Kroner. Oh, I know some of you level three people have just 
ducked under the ducked under the table you're shivering and holding yourself going no 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 don't worry it's nice and easy here uh, the return that we would expect and, and we can do this for particular indexes let's do it for the s p 500 uh, and let's do it for the russell 2000 you have a dividend yield minus the change in shares so if you have share buybacks this term here would be negative a negative negative is a positive right share buybacks boost returns so your uh, income return is a function of your dividend yield and your share buybacks. Uh, on the S&P, you're about 1.8%. Share buybacks now have a 1% tax on them, but companies have been announcing share buybacks. In the S&P 500, if you've been listening to the earnings call, almost every company has share buybacks on the shelf. Uh, we have this much unused capacity in our share buyback or have announced share buybacks. Uh, for the S&P 500, here's one thing I'm fairly certain of going forward for the next year. Buybacks will be greater than share issuance. Now, none of the, I don't think any of the S&P 500 companies are doing secondary share offerings. Not at their size. They're not doing that. They're not raising capital by issuing more shares. Not doing that. So I think for the S&P, buybacks will be greater than share issuance. So this term here uh, will be additive to the dividend yield let's say 1.2%. So let's say you're getting 3% on uh, the S&P 500. Let's think about it in terms of the Russell 2000. Uh, much much lower dividend yield, something like 0.6%. It's a much lower dividend yield. And this is small cap stocks. We know that a lot of them are, are unprofitable. Some 35% of the Russell 2000 is unprofitable. Uh, more likely to do share issuance than share buyback. So here I say share issuance greater than share buyback, which would subtract from the dividend yield. Let's say it's about even. Let's just say we're going to get zero income uh, from that component. I'm doing this in a naive sense, but uh, you get the direction that I'm going in. Uh, the buybacks on the S&P probably will outweigh the share issuance. I don't expect there'd be any share issuance on, on S&P 500 shares, but on uh, Russell 2000, uh, I think you will get secondary offerings to shore up balance sheets, especially for the 35% that are unprofitable. Let's think about uh, percentage change uh, in earnings going forward. Where would we get that kind of information? We get it from a report called Corporate Profits. Uh, when we get our first look at GDP, we do not get corporate profits. When we get our second look at GDP, we get corporate profits. So we will get another report from corporate profits this week. 2021, corporate profits grew 22.6%. We all knew what kind of year that was in the market, right? 2022, corporate profits grew at 6.6%, but interest rates just beat the hell out of the market and uh, while well, we saw what 2022 was like the fourth quarter of 2022 negative two percent growth in corporate profits the first quarter of 2023 negative 4.1 percent in corporate profits there is your earnings recession if we think about two consecutive quarters of negative growth there is your earnings recession so if somebody says we are in an earnings recession you're absolutely right we are in an earnings recession so we've had the earnings recession, you can say, but from very high levels, from very high levels, you could say, well, I don't know, is, is that really an earnings recession or are we just correcting from the overshoot? I mean, we did overshoot, right? So would you call it a recession if you're just correcting from an overshoot? Difficult to say. Uh, well, for uh, Q2, August 30th at 8.30, uh, with the GDP second estimate, we get another look at corporate profits. And from there, we can put the number into change in earnings. So let's say it comes in at negative 3%. So for the S&P, we have 3% income, but you would be taking it away in the earnings growth with negative 3%. You'd be zero. Any, any return we get would have to be purely multiple expansion. And, and you would need irrationality to expand your multiple, to be willing to pay more for earnings after three quarters of negative earnings growth. It would have to be purely behavioral, not fundamental, right? So this number here, this corporate profits number is going to give us this. This, I think, 
This first term, the income term over here, I think we can put 3% down and be fairly in the ballpark on the 3%. This number here will tell us this number. If this comes in positive, let's say this comes in at uh, 4%, well then you can expect earnings multiple expansion. Maybe, uh, you know, 2% there. 2% or maybe even 3% on, on, on the uh, uh, multiple expansion. So you get a 4% over here, you put a 3% over here. With a 3%, you can expect 10% over the next 12 months. So the Wednesday number for earnings is even more important because we're going to get this. If it's negative, in other words, if we had earnings, which then overshot and then are correcting down to this. Let's say that was the trend and overshot. And there's your first quarter. There's your second quarter. You need a couple more quarters to get back to the trend. If that is the case and we see another negative number, well, what are we going to put in here? Right? You're going to have to put, you know, if you think, well, okay, we've overshot. We're coming down. Maybe I'm not going to put the negative number, but you know, it's certainly not going to have growth. Maybe you'll put zero in there. If you put zero there... Why are we expanding our multiple for zero? So the best case scenario in that is 3%. For uh, the Russell 2000, uh, the earnings growth that we get in here would be slightly below. If so, we have negative 4% earnings growth. It would be lower uh, for those companies because they have much higher uh, interest expense cost relative to their earnings, relative to their EBIT. So you'd put in a lower uh, amount on that, and you certainly wouldn't have a multiple expansion there. Let's have a look at uh, the economic calendar for the week. And for the earnings calendar, it's a small group of companies uh, that are reporting, but we'll have a look at uh, who they are. All right, for Monday, uh, you have Treasury issuance. Tuesday, uh, consumer confidence. At the same time, you get jolts, both openings and quits. Half an hour later, uh, Dallas Services Index. Next day, there's ADP at 8.30. Or sorry, 8.15 ADP, 8.30 GDP. It's our second look at it. Uh, previous was 2%, forecast is 2.4. There's corporate profits. You don't get that with the first look. You get it with the second look. So we'll get corporate profits. Uh, going down into Thursday. For PCE and PCE, along with personal income, personal spending. And then going into Friday, you have the jobs report. Okay, so here we are for the week. Not a lot. Um, consumer staples are heavily represented here. Smucker, you have Campbell Soup, Dollar General, and Hormel Foods. I don't know that uh, you can get out of a supermarket without having something uh, from Campbell or Hormel in your, uh, or, <laughs> or Smucker in your cart. On the IT side, Hewlett Packard, Broadcom. On the services side, Salesforce.com. Uh, and you got uh, two health cares in here, Catalant and uh, where are we? Cooper Companies. And you have some alcohol in there too, Brown Foreman. And that wraps it up for the week.